So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So we're about to get started. So I'd like to make sure that everyone is familiar with the environment that we're in. And I know you've probably already just came from another session, so you are. So over to the right of your screen is the toolbox where you can chat or ask a question. Uh, so maybe just to make sure everyone knows that Sarah, you can tell us where you're from. And I am in Houston, so I'll put that uh, in the chat. So um, when we want to ask questions, we do have several questions lined up for the panelists today, but you are also able to add questions. So if you go just over one by chat, there's a QA and a and you can add your questions there. We'll try to incorporate them into the, the panel and we'll leave a few minutes at the end in case uh, we want to have some additional questions. But if we don't get to it, we will also come to you afterwards in, in an email and answer your questions. So we'll make sure that all the questions get answered. So um, use the Q&A tool to keep track and we'll, make, we'll take care of the questions as they come in. And we're going to run this track for 59 minutes. So we're already out of two minutes. So I have to get moving. And um, it wouldn't be possible to run this virtual conference without our sponsors. So I really want to thank Influx Data. So Influx DB is a purpose built for handling time series data at massive scale for real time analytics. And um, I'm happy to be hosting this, this great panel. Uh, it is called uh, Driving Operational Excellence with IoT and Advanced Analytics, A Path to Manufacturing Success. I've spent some time these past months uh, reviewing different IoT use cases and looking at all the different connectivity uh, selections. And I think the um, conversation that you're going to hear today is going to be very enlightening for you. Uh, so we have an excellent group of speakers, and I'm sure that you're going to get a lot out of this. So briefly about me, if you don't know me, I'm Jane Arnold. I have over 30 years experience in chemical discrete and additive manufacturing, most of that chemical, but I, I have always worked on the technical side, a control engineer, had the opportunity to be a plant manager and then head of global technology. Uh, today I'm with Aperio as an independent member of the board, but also supporting product development and they're working on the data quality problem. Um, and I would like for each of the panelists to introduce themselves uh, from my left to right. So we're going to start with Jay first. Hi, thank you, Jane. Um, my name is Jay Clifford. I'm a developer advocate for Influx Data. Um, in my previous life, um, I was basically a sales engineer for an industrial solutions company. Um, essentially referred to myself as a data plumber, uh, basically was connecting PLCs from the, the shop floor um, to IT based systems um, and, and leveraging basically sensors and other edge devices to allow people to operate on machine data in a very novel level compared to how we can do things nowadays. Um, and now I swapped to the dark side and part of InfluxDB. Um, and I work as an advocate there where we basically collect and store lots of industrial data um, for customers who are doing exactly the same thing. Thank you very much. Um, Sebastian? Sure. Thank you, Jane. And good morning, <clears throat> good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, colleagues and audience. My name is Sebastian Trolli. I'm based out of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I'm research manager and global head of the industrial automation program at Frost and Sullivan. I have almost 20 years of experience in the manufacturing, industrial automation, and industrial software landscapes. Uh, I would say that my journey started in, in the manufacturing sector, working for chemical-related companies, uh, leveraging my chemical engineering background. And then uh, later, I spent uh, 13 years in a big industrial automation and industrial software vendor provider uh, in their process solutions and connected industrial divisions, right? Uh, starting as a project engineer first, and then ended up ending up as a solutions consultant, right? And then I joined Frost & Sullivan back in August 2021 to track the entire industrial automation, industrial software, and digital spaces, right? Their technology evolution, market trends, and growth opportunities. So I'm delighted to share my insights with you today, and I look forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Michael, please. Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Michael. I'm based in, in Germany, close to Frankfurt in Würzburg. Uh, um, I have a background of 18 years in automation, PLC. Uh, I'm a PLC plumber. I, I'm not sure if I can tell that. I actually started my, my career um, 
in Argentina, so in the home country of, of Sebastian, doing retrofits, doing Industry 4.0 when it wasn't called like that, <laughs> connecting, uh, unfortunately, SQL databases to production data. Um, and uh, fast forward um, some years, um, I'm now with IoT more than five, six years, more or less. And we introduced a new automation platform because we felt it's absolutely needed in order to, to achieve real IIoT, to link the OT and the IT in a better way. And, and that's ContraX Automation, a platform that Bosch Rexroth has launched uh, in 2019. Um, and I'm now responsible for our partner um, ecosystem because we believe uh, we have so many, let's say, complex problems to solve. None of any company can do it alone, and it's always good to do it in partnerships to solve these challenging tasks. And I'm um, happy to be here as a panelist to uh, discuss a bit about our experiences by connecting shop floors to IoT uh, databases um, like Influx and, and our learnings. So I'm looking forward to this session. Okay, thank you very much. Now we're going to move into our prepared questions. I'd like to remind the audience to use the Q&A if you'd like to ask questions. I will mo not monitor the chat. So we're going to start off with IIoT and manufacturing. And the first question uh, starts with Sebastian. So how has the importance of machine data evolved in recent years? And how is it shaping the future of industrial analytics? Okay, well, thanks, Jane. Uh, so I think and I think we all agree with this, right? I believe we are currently witnessing a, a crucial moment in the development of industrial technology, right? And and the importance of machine data has grown exponentially. Uh, essentially, I would say reshaping the whole industrial analytics space, right? And in recent years, IIoT has transformed the way we view and use machine data, right? Because I would say that previously, uh, machine data was seen as a byproduct, right, of, of industrial processes, right? Something that it was not really, really, really important, right? Uh, especially for decision making, right? Uh, however, they are now invaluable assets that drive operational excellence, right? And I also think that the proliferation of IIoT devices led to an unprecedented uh, volume, variety, and velocity of data, right? And when used effectively, this data provides deep insights into manufacturing operations. And this includes, for instance, typical use cases such as real-time monitoring of equipment health, predictive maintenance, energy management, and, and much, much more, right? And these capabilities are not only enhancing operational efficiency, but also redefining it, right? But I think that the question here is, uh, why is all of this important, right? And I think that in today's competitive landscape, uh, operational excellence is about being agile, efficient, and, and predictive, right? And it's about making decisions faster and more accurately than ever before. So this is where advanced analytics and also time series database come into play, right? So just to conclude, uh, the role of machine data in industrial analytics will only become more and more significant, more and more important. Why? because we are moving towards a future where smart factories are not just a, con a concept, but a concrete reality, right? And a future where AI and machine learning will play a pivotal role in making sense of huge amounts of data. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I completely agree with Sebastian on this. I think, you know, the, the, the buzzwords in the industry have forever been things like, you know, overall equipment effectiveness, operational efficiency, that like time and time again, when you when you sort of discuss with a factory what's, the key metrics they want to measure it's these things and like your single sort of source of truth there is of course like your machine data your your the basically the operation of that machine data like Sebastian said like anomaly detection in your machines looking how your machines are pre performing over time all sort of bubbles up into KPIs like this and the, the thing that I think is evolving the most and I've seen over the, the years is now when manufacturers go to market to look for new machines to add to their product line or to their manufacturing line, a, a key decision maker now is the connectivity of that machine and being able to basically plug into an open data plane so they can monitor those machines. Um, and I think the machine providers and makers are seeing this and enabling more and more data to be basically gleamed from these machines. Um, and I think now the evolution is right. It's, it's the critical part is how do we collect this data? How do we clean this data? And you know how do we work with this data in a, in a way that's usable for the manufacturers? Thank you. So it's it's uh, it's funny you mentioned all the different use cases that are going on, and I've seen so much growing, especially when you look at 
the, the second tier assets that the ones that we used to drive out to to check, right? And now it's all you know using uh, connectivity and pulling that data in. But but as we start to amass all the data in all the different systems, what are you seeing is the most uh, significant challenges that organizations face when collecting, storing, and analyzing machine data? And, and how can this be overcome? Because I really see a lot of challenges there. And Michael, I was wondering if we could start with you. Yeah, it's, 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 it's nice to speak about having the data then in an influx data, uh, database, but um, how to get the data there first, yeah? And, and the biggest hurdle, I would say, and our experience is connectivity. Yeah, it, it seems very uh, simple, um, but um, we need to face the truth. Today, uh, 80 or 90 percent of the machines on the shop floor, they don't see the Internet. Yeah, they are not connected. Yeah. Why are they not connected? Hey, we have in Germany, we have industry four since, I don't know, 10 years, <laughs> but still not every machine is connected. Why is that? Because of the of the of the costs that are involved to to actually connect to legacy OT systems, yeah, to legacy PLCs, because um, we are not uh, in IT, we are not changing our equipment um, every five years when there's a new server coming out. I mean, uh, machines run 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so so we, need to, we need to find a way to connect in an easy way to this legacy um, OT stuff yeah? uh, and to read out the data that we can an start analyzing them. And that I think is the biggest hurdle and the most cost driver um, that, that I've seen so far in, in pilots and, and in companies is how to get to these uh, data data stuff. Yeah, that, I think that's the biggest hurdle um, before you really think about all the nice use cases that Sebastian was, was mentioning. Um, you need to overcome this, this connectivity hurdle in a nice and efficient and cost efficient way, first of all, that you can really calculate a nice return on invest, Sebastian, uh, once you establish a, a nice predictive maintenance um, uh, application, maybe on top of the data, you, you need to calculate how to get the data. Yeah, and I think this is still the biggest hurdle that, that we face and that we see. And, and technology companies need to make it easy for the user to get to the, to the data. Yeah? Yes, I uh, agree completely. And I was, as you were speaking, I was thinking of all of the industry standards that are out there. And I think it's time that we also have that. I don't know if it's already started, um, but but to have an easy way, you know, open standard where we could all solve the same problems and benefit from each other's work. So I, I kind of agree with you there, Jane, but I feel like there's always a battle in standard. I, even like in standardization, yeah. there's always a battle, right? So like yeah. people want to standardize on like OPC UA and people want to standardize on um, sort of like MQTT or Modbus. Um, but then it's like that you've got these basically these these families or regions of PLC providers all standardizing and they all still enter the shop floor in some way. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I agree with like hands. It's like one of the single hardest things is like finding um a piece like a, a platform that allows you to interface and connect with all of these different protocols or even some proprietary protocols on the floor um i think people like kepware right have been this is like they have been around for years um and they are one of like the main um ways of plugging into lots of different machines like this and it's why they're so successful um yeah it's it's a really interesting landscape at the moment especially with the standardization of protocols Yes. Yeah, especially, but if I if I may add, um, uh, um, I think as a, on a protocol level, uh, there there are certain protocols that that are the the quasi standards nowadays anyway. Um, and as a as a let's say machine user, you need to buy machines that support these protocols in order to really benefit uh, of them. And I also yeah. learned that um, many companies don't put this in their in their let's say when they search for a machine, they don't ask that the control has an OPC UA connectivity because I think OPC UA is pretty much the standard. MQTT somehow really also entered uh, in, in into production. So those are standards, Jane, that, that has been established. But the, the user must also ask when they buy equipment that this is supported, um, that they can easily plug in and, 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 and enjoy the benefits out of it. Yeah. yeah, that's right, Hans and Jay. I completely agree with you. Just let me add uh, another challenge that I see in the space uh, beyond connectivity, which is maybe the, the 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 most relevant one is to ensure data quality data integrity and also data security right and that implies also 
to implement robust security measures, a, a very uh, strong data governance policies. So once we get the data, once we solve the connectivity problem, we need to ensure that data is uh, has the, the, the necessary quality, the necessary integrity, and the necessary security, right? Let, to be later contextualized and then apply analytics to it uh, to get you know the desired results or the desired information to proceed with uh, actionable insects, right? So that's my, my, my addition. I, I agree, and it's a great segue into the next question, actually. So um, when we talk about pulling all this data together and getting all the connectivity right and, and having continuous data that we can work with and actually make data-driven decisions, um, so, so Jay, I, I would like to start with you. Can you provide some examples of how advanced analytics and machine learning algorithms have been integrated in industrial processes to improve efficiency and decision making? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, going on from what Sebastian said earlier, so sort of once we cross those hurdles of data integration and look at things like data cleaning and making sure that we're getting the right data, the, the next step that you sort of hit is once once you have that data available is how do we perform um, something that hits your KPIs, which is normally along the lines of either anomaly detection to start, which then moves into something like predictive maintenance later. You kind of have that first hurdle of basically saying, what's wrong first, can I identify when it's wrong and then predicting when it's wrong or when it's going to be wrong later. Um, we've seen customers a lot of the time start with basically basic statistical analysis for their machine data. So a lot of the time we see people do what we call sort of like um, like basic thresholding. So when certain sensor values hit a certain rate, then we know that this is considered anomalous in the data. The, the, the problem I see with those methods is, uh, uh, you know, we're not in a perfect world. A lot of the time, your vibration isn't going to jump up past a certain threshold and you're not going to have that on a consistent level to know when there's an anomaly. Um, other people move into much more sort of complicated methods of sort of statistical methods, sort of like one one of the, the crazy ones we look at here is sort of like autoregressive sort of integrated moving averages. Um, and the idea here is essentially what you're doing is you're forecasting your predicted next, say, vibration value, and then you compare what the actual value was to your predicted value. And then based on like the 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 deviation between your predicted, um, that kind of gives you an idea of like how the deviation uh, from the pact almost. And, and that's considered anomalous. Um, where I see a lot of people going now and we sort of this avenue of sort of artificial intelligence and machine learning is a lot of people are swapping to basically sort of like the the the, the sexier neural network um, stage of looking at things. And interestingly, there's been one that's come out of the woodwork that I never expected to see. And, and they're classified as auto encoders. And essentially what they are, uh, we see a customer implemented one of these where basically you train an auto encoder on what you consider good machine data. So you could say, this is what my machine run looks like for a certain process and I'll measure the vibration data. Essentially what that autoencoder does, it learns your, your ability to do a good process. And then if you deviate away from that pattern within the process, this basically is considered anomalous data. And it's great for like pattern matching. So those situations where having a threshold or having sort of like those, those data points which are far from your norm is, is not as obvious. It's it's a really clever way of, of doing things. Um, they're really deep on the kind of like the, the sensor side of things. Um, the, the other ways people have sort of implemented sort of like an, deep analytics and, and AI is looking at object detection and quality detection in sort of like your devices. So I was on a, um, in a pharmaceutical company where they basically wanted to identify problems in blister packets and we're looking at sort of segmentation and object detection to look at like piercings or scratches before they enter so there's there's a lot of different ways people are in, implementing analytics um and it just depends where you need to start are you looking at anomaly detection on sort of raw machine data or are you needing something that's a little bit more interesting because you're looking at say the quality of your goods versus how your machines are performing thank you jane uh, sebastian michael do you have anything to add to that no, that, that, that were great great insights by jay i i, I just uh, want to add that perhaps another two uh 
use cases, right, uh, where advanced analytics uh, is uh, gaining a lot of traction and, and really transforming the industry would be, apart for, from predictive maintenance and quality control, is supply chain optimization and then energy management, right? Those are two big, big, big trends in terms of the industrial analytic landscape where that are being transformed by, by these capabilities. And of course, the advent of uh, generative AI and machine learning as well, right? In case of supply chain optimization, for instance, um, you can analyze da data sets such as supplier performance, weather patterns, market demand, logistics costs uh, to optimize inventory levels and, and delivery routes, right? And in terms of energy management, which is extremely important today in terms of sustainability, everyone in the industrial automation, industrial software landscape is talking about sustainability. It's a really massive trend today. Uh, energy management uh, analytics, industrial analytics is really important in energy management because it allows monitoring energy consumption patterns and also optimizing them with machine learning algorithms, right? And of course, th this leads to more sustainable uh, operations and reduced energy costs. So when, when we talk about all of the benefits from the IoT and the advanced analytics, how can we make sure that the companies can measure their return on investment? So, so Michael, how do you see that? What are some of the KPIs to track? There's a simple KPI, and and I mean, I'm I'm from from the Bosch world. We also have more than 200 plants. Uh, if a Bosch plant would like, for example, also to implement our automation platform, they're simply calculating their calculating their return on invest. Yeah, it's 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 plain that simple. It's money. How fast can you earn back the money? Um, and and how can you improve the the, the OEE the overall equipment effectiveness, uh, which involves um, the the measures we we already talked about. So it's always at the end the, the RI and OEE the discussion um, that you need to take and and um, and you need. Uh, I see also a lot of people falling into the trap to love technology too much. Uh, we all love technology. I mean, Jay is a developer advocate, so so he loves technology. So we are we are all engineers. We love technology too much, but but I mean um, we need to face the truth. What does it bring to us actually? When is the return, right? Um, I don't implement blockchain because I like the technology, but there's no use case <laughs> around it. Yes. So um, yeah. So that's the thing. And and how fast can we scale it actually? Uh, uh, once we establish a, a really cool solution, maybe one plant. How can you scale it to the complete plant? How can you scale it to to let's say all the Bosch plants, for example, um, that's that's another key factor, I would say, um, because many of you maybe made pilots, uh, IoT pilots also, and never scaled them. So think right from the beginning when you design a, a pilot about the ROI, how you can improve the OEE, and how can you scale it actually into your organization. So I'm, I'm curious when you when you look at that, how do you get the money to begin with? How do you prove that you're going to meet that ROI? Do you have a, an argument that you use in that? Well, I mean, you 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 simply need to calculate really the the investments that you that you need for the technology and the gains that you expect. And you of course, your customer needs to tell you also what is the current OEE, for example. You need to know actually what is your OEE. I mean, if you don't know your OEE, okay, start first measuring your OEE, right? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and 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 the, the improving that you want to get on the OEE side, um, you 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 need to calculate this. Yeah? I simply. I can agree. I couldn't agree more, Michael. There, like I, feel, we we had a customer once, and it would I would say they were like an angel customer in the fact that they kind of understood exactly how they break, wanted to break down their OEE because a lot of people don't know how to do that. They'll go, I just want my machines running as optimal as possible, but then they don't know how an industrial uh, monitor, like an industrial IoT platform, will help to achieve like more efficiency. Like, how how do I improve like but my like overall equipment effectiveness by you know five percent or something like that and uh, and in, in this case, we had a customer go, OK, so this is a logistics center. We're packing boxes. We want to make sure that our machines can basically we want whatever you implement can reduce the overall time in packing and make sure the efficiency of what people are packing or what machines are packing uh, is down by two, three percent. And and it's having those smaller KPIs that bubble into your um, your overall equipment effectiveness. Um, and it's understanding those um, and basically finding how you can have the, your platform help tackle each of those uh, key asks from, from the customer. 
So as we as we move into that and we're um, figuring out uh, the return on investment and making these efficiency gains and things like that, um, what else is coming down the pipeline? So Sebastian, what are you seeing as emerging trends in future directions um, that are applicable for advanced many, um, advanced analytics and manufacturing? Well, thank you, Jane, and, and this is something that we do that we do on, on uh, we we continuously keep tracking, you know, this uh, industrial analytics, industrial AI markets in, in Frost and Sullivan every single day. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to share some some insights with you regarding this, you know, the trends in these realms, in these spaces, right? I would say that there are a bunch of, of things, of trends, of drivers of these markets or the, of these technologies nowadays. But if I had to I summarize... Oh, sorry. I had to summarize those trends uh, into four mega, mega trends. I would say the first one is the what I call the operationalization of AI and the impact it has in industrial analytics. And with this, I mean that this trend is about moving beyond experimental AI projects to fully operationalize sorry, AI in manufacturing environments, right? And leading to smarter, more efficient, and, and more adaptable production processes. And when we say this to scale from uh, experimental projects to production, there are bunch of AI related technologies that are involved here. For instance, generative AI, of course, today, everyone, it, it's, you know, for, 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 for me and, and for, for, for everyone in, in, I think in the industrial automation, industrial software realm, and maybe in the whole society, you know, generative AI is, is the, the next big thing in humanity. I would say it's comparable to, you know, when the World Wide Web back in the early 90s uh, appeared. And, and perhaps it's even the impact is going to be even bigger, right? So in terms of the manufacturing landscape, right? Generative AI, one of the most important use cases nowadays is the industrial copilots, right? These uh, applications, you know, are built to are built, sorry, to meet the unique needs of, of the diverse manufacturing personnel, delivering personalized assistance for enhanced efficiency and, and, and productivity, right? So these copilots allow intuitive understanding and interaction, enabling users, for instance, to simulate or to delve into what is scenarios to, to uncover specific and actionable opportunities. Another AI-related technology, uh, which is, you know, part of this big mega trend that I mentioned earlier, is uh, natural language processing for that interpretation, right? Uh, imagine conversing, uh, you know, or having a conversation with your data, asking questions and receiving insights in, in plain language, right? And, this advancement democratizes, that's a very important thing, democratizes data analytics, allowing a broader range of stakeholders and not just data scientists to engage with, uh, with and benefit from these insights, right? And we have another AI-related technology that is really uh, reshaping the industrial analytics landscape, which is explainable AI for clarity this time, right? Because explainable AI, what provides is clarity ensuring that AI-driven decisions in manufacturing are trustworthy and, and comprehensible. So that's in a nutshell, what we see is the first or the biggest or the, you know, the most important mega trend nowadays in the industrial analytics, basically operationalization of AI, how it impacts the industrial analytics space. Another big mega trend that we are seeing is edge analytics, right? Edge computing in general, but particularly edge analytics and edge AI, right? Because with edge analytics, manufacturers can achieve faster, more efficient decision making by processing data closer to its source, right? And this is crucial in environments where, and I like to say this, milliseconds matter, such as high speed production lines, for instance, right? And this is why, uh, this is because, sorry, or this is due to uh, the fact that edge analytics reduces latency, eases bandwidth constraints, and also enhances data security in comparison, for instance, to cloud based analytics. And the other mega trend that we are seeing today around the industrial analytics realm is the focus on sustainability. I mentioned this earlier uh, because uh, as industries worldwide grapple with environmental challenges, right, and there is a whole climate change uh, consciousness, consciousness, right, uh, nowadays, applying analytics to optimize resource usage and reduce environmental impact is becoming even more and more important today. So that's in a nutshell among the many, many, many trends that we are seeing in the market today. Uh, I chose those three mega trends to, to share with you today. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think we should, I'm sorry, Michael. 
I just want to say power to the edge. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So when we when we're looking at discrete manufacturing and all of these factories that are set up everywhere, where does time series data really come into all of this? You know, I, I started in chemicals and time series data was common for the major equipment. So when and how is time series data being used to drive operational success in the factory today? Uh, so, Sebastian, you can start. I can start with, if you want. Yeah, sure. And, and this uh, brings me back to my my uh, days as uh, project engineer or field service engineer at, at the industrial automation vendor. So when I, I used to deal with, you know, SQL Server databases and, 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 and similar, right? So uh, I would say that time series Data today is the backbone of modern manufacturing analytics. That's 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 my first thought, right? And uh, in a nutshell, I would say that just for for every everyone here to 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 understand what what I mean, T basically, and Jay knows this better than me. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, please. That in a nutshell, it's a, a time series data. It's a sequence of data points indexed in time order, right? Often consisting of successive or consecutive measurements made over a time interval, right? It could be, in the context of manufacturing, anything from machine temperature readings every second to production outputs uh, count every hour, okay? So I would say that the real power of time series data lies in, in, in its ability to provide a detailed and continuous view of operations, enabling manufacturers to detect patterns, predict trends, and respond proactively to changing conditions. And of course, therefore, extracting meaningful insights from that data. And uh, for instance, let's let's consider predictive maintenance. I know that Jay uh, talked about this uh, a minute ago, but I would say that predictive maintenance nowadays is perhaps a top use case in, in manufacturing analytics, right? Critical applications uh, of uh, time series data today in manufacturing, right? By And by continuously monitoring equipment through sensors, Manufacturer, manufacturers, sorry, can predict failures before they occur, right? And, and this is done by analyzing historical data to identify patterns or anomalies that precede equipment breakdowns, right? And basically, the result of all of this is reduced downtime, increased equipment life, lifespan, sorry, and, and of course, significant cost savings. And I would say that another two meaningful use cases uh, were time series. Uh, database uh, are, are shining, our process optimization, of course, and as I mentioned earlier, supply chain optimi optimization as well, right? Way beyond the factory floor. And I, I need to give you my job, Sebastian. I think you've uh, <laughs> crushed the uh, yeah. <laughs> time series. But yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think it kind of, a, a little bit from the previous question folding into this one, for, for me, a big emerging trend at the moment, and which leads into time series data, is this concept of like uh, like the unified namespace in sort of factory 4.0. And, it, and it's this idea that we have a single source of truth, a, a data repository for all of our uh, data within the factory, whether that be from sort of SCADA systems, from machine data, from PLCs. And this all bubbles into Sebastian's, the idea of bringing generative AI into this because we have a single interoperable data plane for our, and when you look at it, the when you look at data from SCADA system, from processes, um, sort of the, from basically from ERPs and stuff like this, most of the underpinning data is timestamped in some form or some way, whether it be sensor data, that's all raw, as we, we pointed out, whether it be sort of flow management and looking at when different stages or events happens in production, it's timestamped. Um, when we look at specific, if, even if we bubble it into our analytics and we look at anomaly detection, it's timestamped because we want to know when that anomaly occurred. So really that underpinning layer that take look, looks all of our data in the industrial sector is very much underpinned by time series data. And that's why I think it's so necessary. You may not realize you're working with time series data, but if you're working with a timestamp, you are dealing in time series data. And I think that's why it's so important within the industrial sector and to, the, to, to, to understand time series data helps promote operational excellence um, in your understanding of building a, a project, building a platform. So I'm curious, Jay, um, what kind of strategies are you using to effectively integrate and analyze time series data in real time to enhance operations? 
Yeah, so I, I feel like I'm probably going to be biased uh, in, in this one because the, the first thing I'm going to advertise that make sure everyone does on the factory floor is have a time series database. Uh, and, and no matter if it's InfluxDB or another time series but a database offering, um, I think one of the key the key asks when we look at um, working with basically looking at sort of time series analytics and looking at your machine data is having, having a storage solution that's low cost, highly flexible, can either be deployed at the edge or in the cloud or in some places a, a hybrid approach um and but really one of the, the the two key areas here is that it needs to be able to treat time series data as a first class citizen and, and what i mean by that is that it needs to basically treat your timestamp like the primary key like you would in a sql database uh, you need to be able to perform queries over time and look at trends in your data um, and really how I see a time series database is it basically bridges your OT and your IT world by standardizing how data should be ingested and stored and then the retrieval from integrating IT systems. So it gives you the, the best of both worlds. And I, I think it also gives you a foundational layer to build your own solutions on top of. Um, I think there's like a, a the, the second part to that is I think there's it's the methodology of how you want to build your solution for to as well in, in analyzing time series data. I think there's a there's a build versus buy argument out there. And I feel like turnkey solutions for some people are the way to go. If you don't have a lot of domain knowledge or experience or time to build out your own solutions, then you can tackle this with solution providers or one-stop shops um, to, to analyze the machines that you have. But my golden rule is if you have the expertise and you have the drive in um, your manufacturing engineers, then let them upskill, let them develop their own time series analytic solutions that best reflect the machines you have on the shop floor, because they're going to know the machines better than anyone else is who's who's coming in. You, I, I see the way we're building our technology. When you look at sort of like the Control X core from Michael, or you look at InfluxDB, we're enabling people to build their own solutions um, for time series analytics rather than forcing them to think about it in a specific way. Um, and I'm hoping that's where the industry is going is enabling the people with the expertise to be able to build um, time series analytics solutions. And if I if I may add, mostly these these people don't don't get, for example, to OT data so easily. So I think one of the success pillars would be also to get the data very fast out of these OT devices, um, like with the Telegraph app, for example, um, into a database and the database is running on a typical, let's say, database device, which is made for, for storage and is cheap for storage and uh, edge server or something like that. So um, so we support we support Telegraph, for example, to, to to move the data uh, quickly out as fast as possible and, and then to, to do the analytics somewhere else. And and for people who don't know what, what's time series data, I mean, when you look at the dashboard, when you look at the Grafana dashboard, the data below <laughs> is time series data. Yeah. Right. Um, so so everybody who has seen a dashboard in production has seen time series data at the end. Yeah, so great. Um, so let's, let's move on to the IoT infrastructure and worker success. Um, so, so Michael, I'd like to start with you. What are the critical elements in creating a scalable and effective IoT infrastructure and manufacturing? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and let me move maybe also to the human side a little bit. Um, so uh, again, I come back to the thing that we are all technicians and maybe we sit in our office and we think about the great uh, uh, time series database solution with a dashboard uh, for predictive maintenance but it's not actually what's needed in your production. <laughs> so um, I would bring in always uh, uh, for this also the workers that are actually working on the machine. What kind of information do they need? You mostly see this information sticked on paper on the machine HMI um, uh, with some guidance for the next operator. Yeah, um, and, and I think this is, when you think about infrastructure and, and ideas, don't uh, forget about the people who are actually, let's say, close to the process that, that could bring you the insights that you are looking for in the data later on. Yeah? Um, so infrastructure for me is also involving people somehow. Yeah? 
and and and, and for the rest i think uh, jay can can much better explain how to structure well uh let's say an, an iot architecture including a database and i would say move the data out very quickly out of the ot into the it where, where it belongs where you can do all the nice stuff and involve the operator I think, I think to add to that, I was chatting to Sebastian before we sort of started the um, the webinar and, and to sort of sing the praises of what you're doing at Control X a little bit, Michael, is I think for me, one of the biggest things for a scalable and effective um, infrastructure in I IoT is building on like an open ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's sort of an incredible journey how you have basically built around the Control X core this, this great community of open source projects and open source um, platforms and projects that can be installed to your device but it's it's the community around it that you've basically like brought in and then sort of encapsulated yeah. on Linux. and I, I think for me that's a huge success point for anyone that's wanting to buy sort of like IoT based hardware um, or sort of control based hardware is having that open plane of data and being able to scale or basically mix and match almost like Lego the bits that you need yeah. uh, to make a successful solution and actually also utilizing a lot of great open source uh, um, uh, software tools that are out there and and um, that, that get improved by the community yeah and then getting pro professional service by, by the companies behind these projects sponsoring them but i see huge potential in applying let's say common knowledge that we all have that we mm -hmm. all share and applying open source in production and, and this is what we are also fostering here um and and then let's say commercialized uh, versions uh of open source with, with professional services um that you don't need to compile the app by yourself yeah um right. th this is a key factor um because because then you are not depending on, on one company uh, uh delivering you a, a full stack uh, from the sensor to the cloud and you can never go out of this you can never go out of this let's say uh, a closed loop of this company this this enclosed um, some people say ego system yeah uh, instead of an ecosystem with, with open partnerships yeah yeah that's right and if i may jane and, and michael and, and jay just to add three three very quick concepts here uh, of course having an open ecosystem you know is is, is paramount but then i would add don't forget about cybersecurity. right no. today cybersecurity is extremely extremely uh, important. There are a lot of cyber attacks to manufacturing facilities. So ensure you have a robust, not, not just a robust cybersecurity solution, but a, also a robust data governance, governance program and a robust cybersecurity policy in place uh, helps a lot, you know, to, to, to uh, build this uh, resilient IIoT infrastructure as well. And of course, interoperability through uh, protocol standardization, right? Uh, and one more thing I would I would add is uh, to have a flexible uh, network infrastructure capable of, you know, uh, supporting uh, technological advancement advancements in communications such as 5G, for instance, which is another really big trend in in today's uh, industrial automation landscape. Those are the three concepts that I wanted to to add. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was wondering um, if maybe you could give some specific um, examples of IoT applications that have significantly contributed to improving working, worker skills, safety, and efficiency. We've, we've been talking about that, but I'd like to see, hear some real examples um, using IoT and how that, that uh, works. Sure, sure, Jane, I, I can take it if I may. So in terms of, I would say that in terms of worker safety and worker efficiency, today we have some IoT applications like uh, smart sensor and wearable devices, right? Which provide uh, unprecedented safety levels, okay? So because these devices can monitor environmental conditions, detect hazardous situations, right? And even predict, uh, I would say, potential accidents before they occur, right? Uh, just to give you a, a specific example, in high-risk environments, sensors can detect toxic, toxic gas levels or extreme temperatures, uh, alerting workers to evacuate or to take precautionary measures, right? So that's in terms of worker safety or work and worker efficiency, typical use cases, right? In terms of uh, skills development and skills training and development, I would say that today the immersive 
technologies such as augmented reality and virtual reality are uh, giving workers the ability to simulate and practice complex uh, procedures in a safe, controlled environment, leading to a more skilled and confident workforce, right? Uh, for instance, AR can overlay, you know, digital information on top of uh, physical or onto physical equipment, guiding workers through maintenance procedures, reducing errors and, and increasing efficiency as well. So basically, in terms of workforce training, skills training and, and, and safety, uh, I would say that wearable devices, AR, VR, immersive technologies and smart sensors are three typical technologies and use cases that are uh, populating this landscape today. Yeah, okay. uh, and I, I think it's quite interesting the fact like um, for me, there was quite a personal project that we worked on that that kind of sort of highlighted a lot of these things and, and uh, highlighted sort of like the the, the enhancement of worker training and sort of that augmented reality style um, project, uh, Sebastian. I mean, my, Michael know himself, like Germany has like some of the most progressive worker rights laws in the world and it's incredible. And, and for industrial IoT solutions to survive in Germany, it's more about the enhancement of like the, the plant floor worker and how we can let them do their jobs better mm -hmm. versus replacing them because you need an extremely credible reason to, to replace workers on in on like the factory floor in Germany, which I think is the way we should be looking at things. I think we should be enhancing the skills rather than trying to replace people. Um, and we we had a project where we worked for a sort of a, a, again a logistics center in Germany, a well known one, and and they basically wanted to again uh, sort of efficiently pack a pallet. And and the idea was is that they had a lot of seasonal workers, a lot of returning workers, and some of these workers were complete experts. They they knew exactly how to pack a pallet. They knew how to do it properly, and their speed was going to surpass a, a robot arm doing it any day of the week. The the problem that they had was when they brought in new workers, they had to use a lot of these seasonal workers to upskill these new workers, which basically reduced the amount of time that they had to to actually do their own pallets. Um, and so the idea was encapsulating their knowledge with sort of like a projection system. And we basically could then almost use like, um, oh, I've lost what the old fashioned game is called now, Tetris, where you could basically highlight and place where parcels should go and, and, and do this type of thing. Um, and I think that's a really important look is like in, in this, I think Hans touched on in his last chat as well was basically, I think workers should be involved with in, in every stage of the process when yeah. developing an industrial IoT solution, um, because they're the ones that's going to be using it at the end of the day, um, not the C-suite executives looking for the reports. Yes. I, I have to say, I have to say thank you to, to Jay to say old fashioned game Tetris. Um, I feel old now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel old now. Uh, yeah, and if I, if I may, I just want another cool example. I, I, I find it quite remarkable involving the operator is, is uh, Node Red, for example, another great oh, open source yeah. tool. And, yeah. and how people apply Node Red nowadays uh, in the industry. And actually, an operator can put node flows maybe to connect some signals. We overcome the hurdle of an expensive connectivity, you know, and, and link the data then to, to a database, for example. I, I see Node Red as a huge success on our platform, the Node Red app. And, and I did not expect it in the beginning when we saw it five, six years ago, but it's, it turned out really great. And, and another great open source example, I would say, and the, and the simple one, of course, augmented reality and, and the stuff that Sebastian mentioned is, is what will drive us in the future. But maybe if you want to start today, start thinking about applying uh, these simple things like a ledge device, not red database, mm -hmm. and, and uh, go to your bottleneck machine. Many people just don't connect all machine, just the bottleneck machine, mm -hmm. which they suspect in their line to bring down the OEE and start start analyzing why why it's stopping. Yeah. No, I agree. Completely agree. So I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, turn to the Q&A because we have actually quite a few um, on this first one and, and on this tool, you can actually vote. So the one that's on top, I, I think I want to start with Jay and I think it's more of a, a clarification that's needed. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll read the question and then we can kind of um, pick it apart. Um, so almost all industries use data historians, which is made of time series data, can collect IoT, PLC, controller, CSV, all that kind of stuff. Um, so in, in this case, how is time series data database makes any difference? So yeah. I, I think 
I'm not quite sure if you understand the, the question, Jay, because so if we've already got a data historian and what are we doing now with additional time series databases, um, isn't it a duplication of data? So the, this is a question that we get all the time. And so, so it's okay. I definitely expected to hear it. So th there's, there's two ways that people tackle this. Like um, when we look at um, historians in the industrial sector, a lot of the time we're dealing with very dated technology. They're extremely good at what they do and they're extremely good at looking at storing processes and giving you a holistic view of what's happening. But the, the problem is they, they don't scale based upon your consumption. So they work very well in their operational standard and we don't want to replace that. Um, but what we want to do is provide a gateway to the data scientists and the data engineers who want access to the machine data to be able to operate upon that data without basically breaking down the industrial cycle that's there. So essentially what a data time series database is, is is almost like a bolt on it's an initial application where you feed your raw time your raw machine data to and it basically allows a number of users to scale alongside it um, and allow them to basically interact with the machine data without causing basically stress upon your current data historian. There's a lot of features that a data historian has that like a, an inherent time series database won't because we're used for a variety of other situations. Um, there are definitely historians out there which um, provide a lot more features and capabilities nowadays as well. But again, I would say that their task is purely in the effective process of that data um, as well as storing uh, basically an aggregated view of your machine data. The second way of looking at it is what a lot of people are doing now. So let's look at um, a, a main data historian out there. Let's look at like OSI Pi. Um, that's, you know, it's been around in the industry for a long, long time. It's incredibly good at what it does and it's, it's very domain specific. Um, what we're seeing a lot of is it's expensive. A lot of new modern data historians is extremely expensive to implement on the shop floor. Um, and what people are doing is they're building their own data historians with time series databases underpinning that technology. So with, there's a company out there called Terraga. Um, they're in the uh, essentially in the energy industry. Um, if you have a look at what they're doing is they've used InfluxDB underlining to build their own cloud-based data historian um, on a modern technology stack. Um, and essentially what that enables them to do is have all the benefits of a standard data historian, but that open ecosystem, that that basically that way of dealing with data in a scaled way that works both for IT use cases, but also the OT use cases that data historians are regularly used for. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question in the, um, in an IoT rich manufacturing environment, managing numerous workloads is crucial for operational excellence. How can we effectively segregate these workloads to optimize performance and efficiency in the context of IoT and advanced analytics? Any Buddy? Can we reread that one? I mean, that quite <laughs> you can see it under published Q&A. So an no, IoT rich manufacturing environment, mm -hmm. and there's numerous workloads crucial for operator excellence. Um, how can we effectively segregate the workloads to optimize performance? Because you have all these different sensors and, and tools and hubs and stuff that you're having to use. Um, in, in, in the context of IoT and advanced analytics. So what, what sort of um, efficiency hints can you give? So I think some of it boils into what Michael does with, um, with the control X core is, is leveraging sort of edge analytics as well and offloading some of that data processing into, into sources closer to the edge. Like you could use control X to basically do a lot of data cleaning, making sure that you're preparing your machine data in the right way and bundling what you need into a more central server where you can process um, some some key sort of uh, sort of data analytics upon that. And meaning that you're using your compute in efficient ways um, based upon how you need to deal with that data. Um, Again, other technologies in that area, which sort of enable you to do this is looking at fleet management as well, is how do we deploy 
based mm. upon which apps that we need on certain edge de uh, devices um, and managing, basically seeing your, your manufacturing plant as a swarm of, um, of edge devices, which will have a, a different role within the sort of data pipelining process. That'd be kind of my, my take on the question. I'm not sure if I answered that one. I would think that as you add each new solution that you have to look at your whole work process and, and making sure you've got that workflow assigned and who's actually going to look at it and do anything or somehow come away to, to bring it together more efficiently. Michael, you were saying? No, I was. this is a typical IT question, I would say, and, and it's also related to the network and, and you need to be aware that your network is capable. Sebastian, I think you told this uh, before already, uh, so monitor the network traffic, uh, uh, depending on the workload of data that you want to push through the network. Yeah, um, And there are switches where you can monitor this very effectively, um, because if your network breaks down, your production also breaks down because the MES data is not coming to the machine. So, um, But this, I think I, an IT network guy would answer this question in a, in a very IT style, I would say. Um, <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm the OT guy here. So. No, and I, and I also I would also add that perhaps you you, you may think of uh, you know uh, three branch architecture where you have edge computing right at the at the floor level at the shop floor level then you have perhaps fog computing right uh, kind of several uh, different ecosystems of 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 uh, edge right servers sending data to these fog computers and then another level cloud computing right so perhaps. Uh, with that, uh, you know, uh, di differentiating the, your network infrastructure into those three uh, stages, right? Or those three layers, edge computing, fog computing, and cloud computing will help you to, uh, you know, manage the different workloads. But for me, in, at this particular point, edge computing uh, with edge analytics and edge AI is essential, right? So we have only one minute left for a question. Um, I'll, I'll ask this one. So retrofit is still a prohibitive cost. Um, how do you show return on investment when you need to start? Um, sorry, when you need when you need to start at all? I mean, how do you, how can you show this goes back to what we we're talking about before? How can you show the benefit before you actually get the money to do anything? When, when you have old legacy equipment and having to retrofit? I think that uh, you, need to, you need to really a bit uh, calculate how much connectivity would cost yeah, and, and the gains mm -hmm. that uh, you want to achieve. I mean, know what, what is the current OEE and, and know what, what you actually want to achieve and, um, and calculate this. Yeah? Um, and if, if the numbers are not good, don't do the project. Yeah? And then the machine is not connected. I think we take away some the, I think we take away some of that stress as well when it comes to sort of um, using open source technologies when it for POCs yeah. but we, 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 we remove some of that overhead cost in terms of software um, so yeah there was another question about an, a real life example and, and maybe just to, to as a final thing uh, we have another partner who is doing also a little bit the monitoring of machines. And uh, they involve the operator in a nice way because they, they give them now a feedback. They installed some sensors, uh, it's in FMCG. And the operator gets a smiley when um, the, 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 the numbers are good of the gods produced. And there is a, an ape holding the eyes like this when, when, when it's not good. And this is gamification. And this is how you engage your operators. Uh, and this, I really love this example. It's so plain, simple, yeah. Um, yeah. But this is a way, a way to start, and there are many examples like this uh, uh, for successful IT project. This is how it started, and it ends at, at advanced analytics with Jay and Sebastian. Yeah, um, but but start small maybe and think really about the operator. Such a nice thing. Yes, Love thank you. So we're we're out of time, so I have to cut you off now. So I want to thank the speakers and for providing insights today, and I hope the audience enjoyed the discussion. And thank you for your great questions that came in. Just a reminder, we will follow up with email to answer your questions more. And uh, thank you very much to Inflex Data, who sponsored this session. And uh, it's time to move on to the next session, which is ROI analysis of IIoT implementation and manufacturing, calculating the business value. So maybe some of the attendees that were here could attend that next one and get their question answered.
Thank you very much.